I think the simplest definition of anarchism is that it's libertarian socialism, but that doesn't mean a lot to people these days because those two ideas seem rather antithetical. Um, anarchism is anti-capitalist, at least capitalism is immoral, damaging to both human beings and the world, and that it needs to be replaced with something else that's not based on a, a profit motive. It's anti-statist, anti-authoritarian, believes that human beings can live their lives per perfectly well, in fact better, without coercion by force. Uh, I would also add to the conventional definition an important element of anarchism both historically and today is that it's not only anti-statist but strongly anti-nationalist and is cosmopolitan, uh, thrives on diversity, not uh, a sort of homogenous universalism. So there are th those that will say that anarchism has always existed, which in a certain sense is true, um, but I don't think that's a very useful sense. Uh, anarchism as a distinct self-conscious ideology and movement is a product of the uh, second half of the 19th century, it already emerged out of uh, socialism, out of European socialism in particular. Uh, it emerged in conjunction with and in reaction to the emergence of both modern world capitalism and the modern nation state. Uh, and was obviously opposed to both of those and the transformations that they were imposing uh, on the globe. Uh, from Europe, however, through immigration, both through labor migrants moving outside of Europe, uh, students, intellectuals moving back and forth, uh, it spread. Oftentimes the experience of migration itself, for instance in North America, in places like Argentina, in Cuba, migration itself was a radicalizing experience, which then turned these, uh, these workers and immigrants into anarchists after they left Europe. Also students, for instance, uh, anarchism spread initially to Asia uh, to, uh, via Japan initially due to intellectuals and students who immigrated uh, initially to California as well as to Paris to study, were exposed to anarchist ideas, brought those ideas back with them, founded movements in Japan, in China, in Korea. Uh, migrant workers uh, also sp spread it to uh, North Africa, South Africa, Australia, um, and, it, and, and again, it's not simply that these people are moving, it's that they're moving as wage laborers under this new emerging capitalist system, uh, and a system in which uh, the power of nation states is consolidating, is making demands for loyalty and for uh, exclusive loyalty and exclusive identif identification with a particular nation state and is making these demands on a large population of people who are moving between nation states and are very resistant to that, who don't identify strongly with, with the nation state. Many of them came from places that weren't nation states. You know, many Italian uh, immigrants didn't think of themselves as Italians when they were in Italy. In the United States, anarchism emerged as a large-scale social political revolutionary movement uh, really only in the 1880s. Uh, and it was from that time until really after the Second World War, anarchism in the United States was a movement composed of first and second generation immigrants, mostly from Europe. But most of those immigrants did not become anarchists until after they arrived. Uh, for instance, uh, Germany and the Russian Empire uh, had virtually no real anarchist movements to speak of in this era. Uh, there were no anarchist groups in Russia until 1903, but the first Russian Jewish anarchist group in New York City was formed in 1887. Uh, in Italy, the story is a bit different. You had a large scale anarchist movement in the 1870s that then declined, and then after that decline, you have an Italian immigrant movement that springs up in the United States. So, it's a movement of immigrants initially in the 1880s. This is a movement mostly of German and Czech immigrants who are uh, heavily involved in the labor movement. A lot of them formerly had been socialists, became disillusioned in parliamentary politics and moved to anarchism in the US. 
as migration changed, as fewer Germans came, more immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe came, they displaced that sort of first wave of anarchists. Uh, the two largest groups were Yiddish speaking Jews from Eastern Europe and Italians. Uh, they formed uh, newspapers with circulations that sometimes reached into the tens of thousands. They formed mutual aid societies, reading groups, radical libraries, radical schools. They spearheaded labor movements and labor ag agitation uh, wherever they happened to be in whatever occupation. They helped Jewish anarchists help form the first some of the first garment workers unions uh, for Jewish workers. Italians helped form some of the first uh, organizations for Italians, whether they were silk workers in Patterson, New Jersey, or unskilled uh, Italians working in California. Uh, and they really created not only not only these more institutional things that I'm talking about, but they created communities uh, and countercultures. They created a whole world where you could be born to anarchist parents, delivered by an anarchist midwife. Uh, yeah, Emma Goldman worked as a midwife for a while, for instance, uh, one of the more prominent American anarchists. Uh, you could attend an anarchist school. You know, when you grew up, you would work uh, somewhere alongside anarchist comrades, belong to the anarchist union. On weekends, you'd go to an anarchist ball, anarchist speeches, anarchist picnics, which were ubiquitous uh, throughout the era. And then when you, when you died, you had an anarchist funeral. It was a whole little microcosm where these individuals to, to at least to the degree that they could, given the constraints uh, of the society in which they live, carve out a real anarchist lifestyle for themselves. Uh, while at the same time, not being content simply to live anarchism as much as they could, but to spread those ideas and to try to take on, uh, directly at times, capitalism, capitalism and the state, um, which is you know, no mean feat to, to attempt, especially when you're a, a working class immigrant of small means. Uh, and it, it's it's really remarkable how they were able to perpetuate these cultures. Um, you had Italian and Yiddish language anarchist newspapers in the United States that continued publication until the 1970s, until really the last surviving members of that generation were dying out. Uh, they tried to pass on these ideas to, to their children, to second generation immigrants, uh, with mixed success. Um, to the extent that anarchism and anarchist groups continue to exist and struggle along through the 1930s, uh, 40s, 50s, it was largely made up of these second generation, um, to that minority of the second generation who carried on the ideals of their parents. Uh, and then in the 1960s with the emergence of the new left in the United States and elsewhere, uh, sort of a whole new segment of society, these radicalized students, uh, were able to tap into the, what survived of the previous movement, draw on some of those ideas, interact with some of those people, and help uh, rebuild uh, an anarchist wing to that new left, which then served as a springboard subsequently for anarchism in the 70s and 80s. Uh, through uh, punk rock and other countercultures, uh, then uh, which got a boost with the anti-globalization movement of the late 90s and 2000s uh, to really give birth to a new sort of generation, uh, a new kind of anarchism, which still has direct links all the way back to those movements from the late 19th century. Uh, but which, again, it's, it's, it's no longer a movement of immigrants. Um, it's no longer based as strongly in uh, working class politics, but that's really where its roots lie, if you trace it back. Uh, so the Haymarket Affair is one of the milestones of American anarchist history. Uh, this occurred in 1886 in the midst of a national campaign uh, of working class and radical organizations to demand an eight hour workday. It's a period in time where the typical workday in industrial America was 10 to 12 hours, there was a weekend, and so forth. Uh, anarchists, uh, at this time, there were several thousand in the United States, uh, lots of immigrants, Germans, Czechs, and so forth, also some native-born Americans, uh, who initially had mixed feelings 
on this eight-hour movement, they some thought it was too reformist for anarchists and revolutionaries to be involved in, but uh, they eventually accepted it as an important struggle, an important starting point. Uh, many anarchists, especially in cities like Chicago, were heavily involved in the labor movement. Uh, and it's there in Chicago uh, that uh, that anarchism had its real center uh, at the time in the United States. Now, on May 1st, 1886, the first May Day, uh, that was the day that was set for a nationwide general strike uh, to demand the, the eight-hour day. In Chicago, about 40,000 uh, workers responded to this call, went out on strike. Many of the, the, the leading figures in the Chicago late labor movement were anarchists and socialists. Uh, on that day, uh, outside of uh, a factory that had already an ongoing strike, there was a scuffle between uh, strikers and strike breakers, and Chicago, Chicago police opened fire, and they killed at least four, four of the strikers. In response to this, three days later, in the Haymarket Square in Chicago, a local anarchist called a protest meeting to protest the police killing. Uh, and they, you know, mounted a wagon and made speeches uh, denouncing the police. Uh, near the end of the meeting, the, the Chicago police moved in, ordered uh, those assembled to disperse. Uh, and in the midst of this, an unknown person still to this day not known, hurled a small bomb into the ranks of the police officers. The bomb exploded, uh, killed one officer, immediately injured several others, and in the ensuing chaos, the police opened fire, uh, killed several protesters, uh, as well as several of their own, uh, own ranks, you know, sort of in the chaos. They, many officers were actually shot in the back and died. And in response to this act, Local authorities in Chicago rounded up all of the labor leaders and socialists and anarchists, uh, raided all of the radical headquarters, and uh, eventually indicted eight leading Chicago anarchists uh, for the murder of uh, the officer who first died uh, from the bomb blast. And these men, who became known as the Haymarket Martyrs, uh, were not charged with throwing the bomb. It was well-established fact that none of them threw the bomb, none of them had anything to do with the actual you know, physical act of the bomb. Instead, they were charged on this uh, tenuous legal argument that their speeches and writings had incited an unknown third party to throw the bomb, even though the police didn't know who this third party was and could not actually, ever, you know, there was not a shred of evidence, essentially. Uh, but public opinion, and in particular the opinion of the authorities of the business community, was uh, lethal, it turned out, to these anarchists, to the Haymarket Martyrs. They were found uh, found guilty of murder. Uh, five, of, five of them were sentenced to death. Uh, the other three were sentenced to long prison terms. And uh, on November 11th, 1877, one of the martyrs, a man named Louis Ling, committed suicide in his cell rather than uh, go to the gallows, and the other four were hung. Uh, these men, the Haymarket Martyrs, uh, became, depending on where you stood politically at the time, were either heroes or villains. Uh, for those to whom they were heroes, uh, they spurred a whole generation into the ranks of anarchism. Uh, some of the best known figures from later in, in American anarchist history, like Emma Goldman, uh, first became aware of anarchism and interested in it because of the Haymarket trial. And its legacy extends further uh, as the origins of May Day, as an international revolutionary working class holiday, uh, which when May Day was uh, sort of established by the International Socialist Movement several years later, it was chosen because of the Haymarket events. Uh, and ironically, although its birthplace is in the United States, May Day is now an all but forgotten holiday uh, here in you know, in the birthplace of this revolutionary uh, movement, this revolutionary holiday celebrating international class solidarity and class struggle. So following the First World War in the United States, there was, and the, the Russian Revolution in Russia, there was a, uh, 
a large-scale reaction against radicalism in America, known as the First Red Scare. Uh, the, and anarchists, socialists, the emerging communist movement were all targeted by federal authorities for repression. Uh, amongst those who ended up being swept up in this campaign in 1919 were two then obscure uh, Italian immigrant anarchists, uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Uh, they were both rank and file militants within the Italian American movement. They belonged to one particular wing of the Italian movement, a wing uh, that closely identified itself with a man named Luigi Galliani, who was a renowned anarchist speaker and writer, uh, a, an ardent revolutionist who promoted uh, violent revolution and insurrection and was opposed to formal organizations, such uh, including labor unions. Uh, he viewed it as inherently uh, bureaucratic and therefore authoritarian. There's a whole other wing that was heavily involved in the labor movement. Uh, so they're, they're not characteristic of the entire Italian movement, but uh, they were arrested uh, as part of the Red Scare, uh, but for a crime that was unrelated to it. They were arrested uh, on suspicion of being involved in a botched robbery in Braintree, Massachusetts, uh, in which a, a payroll guard had been killed and the, the payroll money had been stolen by uh, three men who then sped away in a car. And there was all sorts of conflicting testimony, eyewitness testimony, some of which you know variously identified one or both of the men at the scene but in different roles. Uh, some witnesses who who said things like, oh I could tell he was Italian because he ran like a foreigner. So this is very strongly anti-immigrant environment as well as anti-radical, so they already had two strikes against them. Uh, as the trial went, went forth, it became very apparent that these two factors, the, the uh, anti-immigrant hostility and anti-radical hostility, uh, were not only tolerated by the court, but encouraged by it. Uh, the testimony of other fellow Italian immigrants, who for instance uh, a number of whom testified that they had seen, you know, that Vanzetti, who at the time was, was uh, working as a fish peddler, had sold them, uh, had sold them eel that day. You know, he was nowhere near the scene of the crime. But all of that testimony was discounted out of hand by uh, by the jury, which of course was not made up of immigrants. It was made up of all white native-born American uh, men. The trial, uh, which again never established a credible case against these two men. Uh, dragged on, they were found uh, guilty, but then the, the appeal press pro process, excuse me, the appeal process dragged on uh, for another eight years. Uh, and the case garnered more and more national and then international attention as it became more and more apparent that there was no real case here. Um, and in fact, historians in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, established that the prosecution both suppressed evidence, uh, kept it from the defense evidence that was exculpatory, uh, but also appears to have manufactured ballistics evidence uh, to try to implicate Sacco as one of the shooters in the crime. By 1927, this had become an international cause and you had Sacco and Manzetti uh, protest meetings occurring across Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, it was a, a trial of the century. Uh, despite this, their guilty sentence was upheld. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States refused to hear the case, and they were both sent to the electric chair in 1927, uh, becoming, adding to the ranks of uh, anarchist martyrs uh, and and those who were crushed by the power of the state for both being born in the wrong place and believing the wrong thing. So anarchists have always been not only internationalists uh, but anti-nationalists and what this meant in practice is that they were not only not 
patriots of their home countries and home states. Uh, but that they also extended solidarity through both word and action towards anarchists and workers and those in struggle elsewhere, oftentimes even to the point of risking life and limb. Uh, so examples from the United States, uh, there are several examples of this. The earliest of which is in the Cuban, the attempted Cuban Revolution of the 1890s when uh, Cubans were fighting for independence from the Spanish Empire. A number of not only uh, Cuban anarchists who were living in the United States returned uh, to fight against the Spanish Empire, but Spanish immigrants and Italian immigrants uh, who were living in the United States, many of whom had never been to Cuba, traveled there to fight uh, on behalf of uh, struggle for national liberation. Fast forward a couple decades uh, to 1910, 1911, when revolution breaks out in Mexico. A revolution which incidentally had partially been sparked by and planned by uh, Mexican anarchists, both living in Mexico and living in the United States. Uh, in that instance, you had a few hundred anarchists coming from Canada, uh, the, as far north as Vancouver, as far east as Philadelphia, uh, who went to Mexico. These men were, they were Italian anarchists, they were Swedish, native-born American, African-American. There's even reports of a Chinese restaurant owner taking part, uh, taking up arms alongside the, the anarchist Mexican revolutionaries in northern Mexico, uh, where they briefly conquered the cities of Mexicali and Tijuana. Uh, until they were driven out by federal forces. The, the most, the most large-scale example of this would be the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939, uh, in which Spanish anarchism played a, a large role. The Spanish anarchists uh, were one of the largest forces within the Republican section of Spain. And it's fairly well known that thousands of members of the so-called International Brigades, which were established by uh, the International Communist Movement, went and fought in Spain, including the American Abraham Lincoln Brigade, as it was called. What's not known so widely is that there are also uh, at least two or 3,000 anarchists who came from across the globe, foreign anarchists, many of whom, again, had never been to Spain, but who went there to fight alongside their Spanish comrades, they're fighting not to defend the democratically elected republic. They're fighting to protect and expand the social revolution, the economic and political revolution that was underway in the republican-held parts of Spain uh, under the guidance of anarchists. They were there for, as one uh, Italian anarchist put it, they were there to fight for a patria without borders, right? a homeland or a nation without borders. It didn't matter that it happened to be in Spain. You know, it could have been anywhere. They would have gone. They would have fought. Uh, for this cause. And at least a couple hundred of these international volunteers, again, came from the United States. Italians, uh, Irishmen, uh, first and second generation Eastern European Jews, Native born Americans, who went, uh, took up arms, many of them died, many ended up being imprisoned either by, uh, by uh, Franco's forces uh, or they they fled to France afterwards, where they were then interned by the Vichy regime, and then, in many cases, handed over to Nazis. Uh, some ended up in concentration camps. Uh, but they, again, they were fighting on behalf of uh, an anti-nationalist uh, ideal for the creation of a world in which it wouldn't matter, and to them it didn't matter, where these struggles were taking place. Uh, it was a matter of wherever people were f struggling to create this new world, a new world without borders, without patriotic governments sending people to war. Uh, they would go there. They would risk life and limb, and many did so. So anarchism and Marxism share uh, a critique of capitalism. They both believe capitalism is uh, an exploitative 
ultimately destructive and uh, untenable economic system. What they have traditionally differed on uh, is how to approach the problem of doing away with capitalism, the problem of revolution and what a revolution and a post-revolutionary society would look like. Uh, Marxists, so socialists, communists, and so forth, uh, have traditionally believed that uh, following any successful revolution, a socialist government, what Marx called a dictatorship of the proletariat, which is itself a very vague term that's been interpreted different ways, uh, but some sort of socialist government would be at least temporarily necessary to oversee the process of economic reconstruction and to defend the revolution uh, by organizing a military. Anarchists from the very beginning, from their disagreements with Marx, pointed out that to get rid of one system of government, one state, simply to replace it with another, was to get rid of one problem and put another in its place. Uh, by elevating a group of individuals to power, even if they're dedicated revolutionaries, puts them in an inherently contradictory position where, just like any monarch or politician, just by virtue of circumstance, their main goal will inevitably become maintaining and expanding their own power. Initially, for perfectly good reasons, in order to, to you know, expand the revolution and so forth. Uh, but in the name of holding on to that power and expanding that power, uh, the anarchist argument goes, uh, that becomes an end in itself, and they will not, they will never willingly give up that power, even if they entered into it with the best of intentions. And if you look at the history of socialist revolutions, history, if anything, has vindicated the anarchists on, on that point. Uh, dictatorships, oligarchies do not wither away on their own. Uh, they perpetuate themselves, and in the process of perpetuate the, perpetuating themselves, they ultimately subsume uh, the other gains of a revolutionary movement uh, and create totalitarian or authoritarian societies. I think the 20th century certainly did prove not only that statist socialism doesn't work, but that capitalism does not work. We currently live in an age of economic crisis recurring throughout the globe. Uh, and certainly, uh, the various exper uh, experiments in so-called actually existing socialism have all been miserable, oppressive failures, which is exactly what anarchists at the time, when these uh, various status revolutions were, were coming about, were pointing out would be the inevitable result. So uh, in that sense, Yes, the 20th century certainly showed that state forms of socialism, as well as capitalism, state capitalism, and so forth, are untenable and, and destructive. Um, did the 20th century prove that anarchism cannot work? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, what it did prove was that oftentimes totalitarian governments can crush anarchism. That's a very different... Uh, it's a very different conclusion than that anarchism doesn't work. In the periods, uh, numerous but often brief, when anarchism did exist in Republican Spain during the Spanish Civil War, uh, to different degrees uh, during the Russian Revolution, whether it was in the Ukrainian countryside or in shop committees, uh, anarchism or anarchist-like structures flourished until they were put down by force. Uh, if you take a broader view of human history, Human history shows that human beings can live in anarchistic uh, societies for thousands of years, which is what many human societies did prior to the modern era, which is sort of just a very brief period of time in the long stretch of history. Today's anarchism differs in some ways from so-called classical anarchism of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, but I think 
less so than some people take it for. Um, today's anarchist movement is much, much more aware of, of forms of oppression that extend beyond just capitalism and the state. Uh, racial oppression, gender oppression, and so forth. Uh, and you know the, the, the idea that the personal is political occupies a, a main part, but that's not actually that new to the anarchist movement. Uh, these same concerns you, know, you can find in the 1880s, 1890s, 1910s, and you have uh, Italian newspaper, anarchist newspapers discussing these issues, uh, Yiddish anarchist newspapers discussing these issues, as well as English language papers in the United States uh, discussing this, these issues, even making arguments in the early 20th century, basically arguing that race is a social construction, that, that gender roles are a social construction, um, which should not dictate how people behave or, or are treated. Uh, but that's certainly much more entrenched and systematic and front and center in today's anarchism. Today's anarchists are also, for whatever reason, um, tend to be younger, tend to be drawn not, tend, tend to come into anarchism not through working class organizations and struggles, um, but often through countercultural uh, struggles, or not countercultural movements, uh, become in interested through other avenues. Uh, there, it's less in the United States, it's certainly less of a movement of immigrants. Um, which is both positive and negative. Uh, it's in the sense of the main body of people who make up the movement in the United States, I guess you could say, are more, more mainstream in the sense that they're not coming from marginalized immigrant groups, and therefore, you know, their parents are, uh, or, you know, their family members are part of the sort of mainstream American, America, uh, and in that sense, they are not marginal. But at the same time, uh, the earlier immigrant anarchist movement uh, could, at certain times and places, could take deeper root, specifically because it was an immigrant movement. It could take a root in ethnic enclaves in places like the Lower East Side of New York or the Italian community in, in New Jersey, um, which it's harder for anarchism today to do. Uh, you know, you, you're not going to create a, a widely influential anarchist counterculture in in suburbia. It, it's much more difficult. Uh, whereas in uh, the Lower East Side of New York, at the turn of the century, anarchism and anarchists, anarchist publications, anarchist poetry, anarchist uh, theater was part and parcel of mainstream Yiddish culture in the United States. Everyone knew who the anarchists were. A lot of people who weren't anarchists read the Yiddish anarchist newspapers. Uh, the most prominent early Yiddish poets were anarchists, um, writing on anarchist themes, uh, and working class themes which resonated with, with the, broadly with the working class immigrant audience. Uh, today, although there is there are anarchist countercultures. Uh, I think, in in some ways, those are more marginal. In vis-a-vis -vis mainstream uh, American society, than immigrant anarchism often was within immigrant society. I think anarchism is a worthy goal. A necessary goal, uh, ultimately probably one of the only ways that human beings as a species are going to survive. I certainly, however, don't see it happening tomorrow or the next day. Um, at, at the moment, probably not in my lifetime, but I think if there's two things looking at history and the history of revolutions and revolutionary change can show us. One is that both historians and uh, radicals are notoriously 
terrible at predicting the future. Uh, you never know what will happen. Uh, revolution can break out and uh, spread with incredible speed in a time and a place where no one expected it. So I would not rule out the possibility. Um, it would take, I think, a climatic disaster, whether that's a, a really climatic economic meltdown, um, military conflict, environmental disaster, um, none of which I look forward to. <laughs> Uh, I don't look forward to living through any of that. Uh, but something along those lines probably is inevitable, whether or not it's then followed by something better. And I think it's, it's probably only within that sort of context uh, of a crisis that the opportunities for anarchism to materialize on a large scale uh, exist. And whether or not that will happen now, or in 50 years, or 100, I can't say. <laughs>